church, how is everybody doing today? Uh, my name is Chase, and I'm one of the pastors on staff, and we just wanted to take a minute at the front of our service and just say welcome, and thank you for spending your Sunday morning with us today. Um, it truly is going to be an amazing day. I, I, I can promise you the worship set this, this morning is fantastic, and I, it, it's going to breathe up some life into us this morning as we prepare to worship. And then pastor's going to continue in Acts. And so if you're excited to be here with us this morning, I'm going to go ahead and invite you to stand with us as I turn it over. I would be hopeless without your goodness. I would be desperate. Without your love, save to the darkness. If it wasn't for the cross, you have won me with your kindness. Chase me down when I was lost. When
thankful, God, that in the midst of our battles, we know that you are here. You are faithful and trustworthy. God, your word is that you will never fail us. God, some of us have been hit with situations this week that we know if it wasn't for you in our corner, we wouldn't know where to go. 
A miracle doesn't have to be giving sight to the blind. It's, it's the little things in life that we take for granted that you continually provide for us over and over and over again. And God, we give you the praise. We give you the thanks. God, help us to put our trust in you. God, if, we, if we're here this morning, we were singing that song, miracle after miracle, another one, but God, we're feeling so lonely and we're feeling like we're on an island and that you're not hearing us. God, help us, give us strength to continue pursuing you in prayer and in faith and putting our trust in you because God, we know, God, we know that you have a plan. God, we know that you are the provider of all things. And God, we simply put our faith and our trust in you this morning. God, we love you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for seeing. You can have a seat. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. My name is Luther. I'm one of the pastors here at uh, City Church. I'm, I'm so glad that you're here with us today, uh, especially if you're not a member of City Church or maybe you're not even a Christian. Uh, I'm really glad that you're here. Uh, I want to encourage you to come back if you're not. Uh, and, and the reason is that, you know, Following Christ is a journey. It's a, it's a life journey, and there's so much to learn, and you can't possibly begin to absorb it or understand it in a, in a single day. And I, I promise we won't do anything too weird um, if you come back. Uh, we don't break out the snakes until week five, so you've got at least that much time to, uh, to get to know a few people. No doubt uh, all of you are aware of the controversy surrounding the opening ceremonies of the Summer Olympics in Paris. It included what appeared to be, uh, to many, an overt mockery of Christianity and a parody of the Lord's Supper. Now, I don't understand, uh, or I understand that there's disagreement about what was actually being portrayed, so I'll try not to decipher what was really taking place, because it matters not. I remind you of this. This is not the first time, nor will it be the last time, that the followers of Jesus find themselves in the crosshairs of cultural conflict and ridicule. As early as the second century, the wider public was mocking Christianity. Celsus, who was a second century uh, critic of Christianity, said, Christians are able only to convince the foolish, the dishonorable, and the stupid. Only slaves, women, and children. This isn't new. About 12 years ago, more than 10,000 people gathered on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. for what was called the Reason Rally. The purpose was to unite uh, secular people nationwide. The famed atheist Richard Dawkins spoke that day, and he called on atheists and agnostics alike to ridicule and to show contempt for people who are religious. In fact, he encouraged them to mock publicly those who believe in the supernatural. This isn't new. The more important question is, how should we respond? That's the important question. And that's the important question because our culture is becoming less and less accommodating to Christians. Fewer and fewer people are following Jesus. And it seems we're becoming more polarized by the day. Our passage today in Acts chapter 12 will help us answer this question. How do we respond? So if you have your Bible, I will encourage you to find Acts chapter 12. We've been walking through the book of Acts this summer, one chapter per week. So if we're in chapter 12 this week, next week we will be in chapter 13, exactly. Very good. Now, why study the book of Acts? Why study this book? Um, it's the story of the early church. Uh, well, we want to learn something about the church, don't we? I mean, we are a church. We want to learn something about what it means to be who we are. And I think we also learn something about Jesus. If you want to understand an artist, what do you do? You study their work. And in studying their work, you learn something about the artist. And the church is the work of Jesus. And so I really do think that in studying the early church, we do learn something about Jesus. Now, if you've been studying along with this here, you're going to notice something, uh, two shifts 
in Luke's storytelling here in the early church. The first shift is that you're going to see that the center of Christianity is going to move, and it is moving, from Jerusalem to Antioch. Later on, it's going to move from Antioch to Rome. But you're going to notice this shift here that Antioch is going to become the mission, missionary sending uh, center of the early church. The other shift is that we're going to move from Peter being the central figure of the early church to Paul being the central figure of the early church. You're going to see that shift in this story. So here's what chapter 12 is going to tell us. And this is why it helps us with whatever happened at the Olympics. And if you're a note taker, write this down. Following Christ doesn't come without conflict, even aggression. But the opposition is no match for the power of God. It's no match for the power of God. Now, um, you know, Acts is a narrative. It's a, it's, a, it's a long historical book. And so what I've been trying to do with these chapters is sort of paint the episodes and kind of show you the story. So this chapter 12 has three main episodes in it or three scenes. Uh, the first one is verses 1 to 5. It's the attack on God's people. Second is verses 6 through 17. And that is the rescue by God's power. And then the last is verses 18 to 25, and that is the defeat of God's enemies. So we're going to look at each one of those episodes, and in each one of them, there's some things that we can learn and gl glean and, and grow from that I think can help us walk with Christ daily. Now, our goal today is to let God's Word do what only God's Word can do. It is to let, let it fill us with an unshakable confidence in King Jesus and remind us that our Father sits on the throne of the world, and He's the God who frees prisoners, and He humiliates bullies. And we need to be reminded of that anytime we feel like our faith, our lives, our identity, our Savior is the, the object or the target of ridicule and mockery. So let's begin looking here. The attack on God's people, verses 1 to 5. We're, we're going to just read through the passage together. Verse 1. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. So far in the story, the church has mostly been persecuted by religious authorities, but this is a change. Now it is the political authority, King Herod, also known as Herod Agrippa, who is doing the persecuting. Now, it's tempting to think, Luther, this is ancient history. Who cares? Tell me something that can help me with my life. Well, allow me to tell you about Herod, and then you tell me whether or not it is relevant to our day or not. The Herod family had a reputation for gratuitous violence, and the New Testament is filled with Herod's. Uh, the first Herod we meet is Herod the Great at the birth of Jesus. He's the one that slaughtered all of the babies around Bethlehem. That is the grandfather of this Herod in our story. The other Herod that we meet in the Gospels is Herod Antipas. He's the, he's the son of Herod the Great. He's the uncle of our Herod in Acts chapter 12. He's the Herod who beheaded John the Baptizer. You remember him. Now, this Herod here, Herod Agrippa, Herod the king, was conniving. He convinced the Jewish population that he was their man. And he took every opportunity to win the favor and curry the favor of the Jews. But he's two-faced. When he's in Rome, he was a cosmopolitan Roman. But when he was in Judea, he portrayed himself as a faithful Jew. And there is, he was known for these superficial displays of faithfulness so that when there would be a Jewish festival, it was not unlike him. Uh, one of the historians say that as the people were coming and they were approaching the temple, Herod Agrippa, this is the king. He takes his basket on his shoulder and he marched into the temple just like everybody else. And they all looked at him and said, that's why we like him. He's just like us. There's a story one day of him reading a scripture and it's at the Feast of Tabernacles. And the historians tell us that he, as he read the scripture, he shed tears. And all of the people shouted to him, 
Thou art our brother. Thou art our brother. Thou art our brother. And you are just like us. You are our brother. He was a master politician, giving to Rome what they wanted, giving to the Jews what they wanted. And so they had great affection for Herod, even though he was immoral and dishonest and crooked. They overlooked all of that because of the benefits that he could give them. And Herod wanted the status quo to remain just as it was. And so he ruthlessly persecuted any disturbing minority. And these Christians are a disturbing minority. He saw them as an irritating horsefly that needed to be swatted. And so that's why we read in verse 1 that he, he, doesn't, he doesn't just say that he arrested them. It says he laid violent hands on them. This is a political move. And so in verse 2 we read, he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword, which means he was beheaded. This is James of James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They're called the sons of thunder. Sounds like a WWE tag team, right? It's like the, the rock and roll express or the four horsemen. This is the sons of thunder. And what you're going to see is James is put to death here. That's the first apostle that's killed. Now his brother John is going to be the last apostle to die. But don't let the matter-of-factness of James' execution run by you because it's so short. There's no explanation. There's no reason to kill James. These are not revolutionaries. They're not rioters. They're not zealots. These people are healers. This is just a political maneuver. Herod will do anything, and he will say anything to maintain power. But this must have been devastating to that early church, don't you think? James probably has a wife. He's probably got kids. He definitely has a church family. Can you imagine how shaken they must have been when one of their own is beheaded? Our church will turn 70 this year. As far as I know, our church has never had a martyr in 70 years. Can you imagine how devastated all of us would be if one of our own lost their life because of their faith? So you can imagine they are rattled and they are wondering, why is this happening? How is this happening? So we need, we learn something here. We learn that God is in control even when I suffer. Now you won't see it yet, but as we unpack this story, you will see that God is completely in control. Let's keep reading. Verse 3, when he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. So Peter is testing the waters by killing James. James is number three in charge. He kills James. He tests the, the wind. And they're like, yeah, we really like that. He goes, oh, if they like the death of number three, now we'll go after number one. That'll really get everyone fired up. And so he has Peter arrested. Verse four, after arresting him, he put him in prison handing him over to be guarded by four squads of soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Herod puts Peter in prison, guarded by four squads of soldiers. So Taylor Swift did not invent the squad. They had them way back then. But a, a squad is four soldiers. So this is four squads of four. 16 soldiers. Usually a prisoner was chained to one soldier. Peter has 16 soldiers guarding him. Might this be overkill? Why would they do that? Well, you, these Christians can be slippery. This whole thing got started when we killed one of them, but he didn't stay dead. You remember in this story, this is the third time Peter's been arrested. He was arrested the first time, they let him go. The second time, an angel broke him out of jail. Now this is the third time, so they're taking no chances. 16 soldiers to guard him. But we're also told this other little thing that Herod doesn't want to do anything during Passover. And so basically he said, we don't want to ruin the Jewish holiday weekend, so we won't kill him this weekend, we'll kill him on Monday. And the Jews would say, we're good with Monday killings, we're not good with holiday killings. We're not savages. 
We're people of faith. And so verse 5, Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. It's such an important statement. Such an important, the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The response of the church, when all hell broke loose, was that the church rallied together and prayed. They did not rally together and worry. They rallied together and prayed. They did not rally together and fight. They rallied together and prayed. Earnestly praying, intensely praying, their hearts and their souls are in these prayers. Now, in human eyes, this is a weak response. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had over the years with Christians who insist that prayer alone is not enough to respond to ridicule. That prayer alone is not enough to respond to mocking or to conflict or to persecution. It's only weak if you think little of prayer. It's only weak if you think little of God himself. They understand that God is in control. They're not worried about winning this battle themselves. They know, just as God said to, to Moses and to Israel... Your God will fight for you today. You need only to be still. And so they pray. Now, let me give you just some quick thoughts here about this first section on the the attack and the persecution of God's people. Number one, God is sovereign, but opposition is inevitable. Just because there's opposition, just because there might be ridicule and conflict in our life doesn't mean that God is not in control. God is very much in control. Just open your Bible and pick a tyrant. They're all over the Bible, aren't they? Pharaoh, Ahab, Nebuchadnezzar, Jezebel, Rome, Nero, and on and on we go. We don't go seeking opposition, but we're not surprised by it. And we understand that opposition is not a sign that God is displeased with us. But we know this. Everything those early believers possessed to face a hostile world and to turn it upside down, everything they possessed, you and I possess. We have the same spirit. We have the same scriptures. We have the same salvation. We have the same hope. God is sovereign, but opposition is inevitable. Number two, God is sovereign even when life is confusing. We know God sits on the throne, but there's a lot of things in life we don't understand. We don't know why James is killed, but Peter is not. These are the Peter, James, and John. They're the inner three of Jesus. Why is one of them killed and one of them spared? Do you think God loved Peter more than James? I I don't think so. Our lives are filled with these kind of mysteries, are they not? We see the wicked prosper, and we see the righteous, they sometimes do the opposite of prospering. We see people who would make wonderful parents not able to conceive. And we see other people who are terrible, abusive parents, and they can't stop having kids. One person's life is spared, another loses their life. Some prayers for healing get answered, and some do not. Why do some wicked people win elections? I don't know. I can't begin to understand the complexity of God's will. Sometimes God uses martyrdom to advance the gospel. And sometimes he uses miracles. And you'll see both of those in this story. The Bible says all of these things. Isaiah says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways and my thoughts higher than your ways and your thoughts. So our lives will be filled with things we don't understand, but something we do understand is the hope that is ours. Despite all of that, we have the promise of resurrection, and we have the promise of new creation, that everything killed in God's world will be raised to new life. The third thing we learn is that God is sovereign, but prayer is effective. Sometimes people think that because God is sovereign, it really doesn't matter if you pray. God's going to do what God wants to do, so why pray about it? And the Bible never talks about prayer that way. And it never speaks of God's sovereignty that way. 
Prayer is one of the deep mysteries of God. It's one, you know, sometimes God answers our prayers in dramatic ways. He opens prison doors. He multiplies bread. He raises the dead. But we know prayer doesn't guarantee deliverance, does it? We've all had a James in our life, haven't we? We've all had that sick family member that didn't get healed. That better job that didn't happen. We, we don't pray for our second marriage because we prayed in our first marriage and it didn't work out. And I'm not going to pray because last time I prayed and I got fired, so I'm not going to pray here. And I just thank God that the early church didn't say, well, we prayed for James and he got killed, so we're not going to pray for Peter. I prayed once and it didn't work. Have you read the book of Psalms? About half of them are somebody saying, my prayers aren't working, Lord, but I trust you. Just open them. Thank God they didn't pray that. So our first response might be to protest, but it needs to be to pray. It needs to be to pray. Let this passage encourage you to pray and to pray big prayers. I don't know what they were praying for about Peter. Uh, I hope they weren't praying little tiny prayers like, Lord, let him get a little sentence. I hope they were praying big prayers like, God, bust him out of there. We believe prayer makes a difference. We believe God answers prayer. Scripture never speaks of prayer as if it is useless. God uses the prayers of his children to accomplish his purposes. God has ordained that prayer matters. And so we know the church was praying for James in prison. They knew that God answered prayer, but their prayers weren't answered, were they? We pray fervently, but we know prayer is not a formula. Prayer is not a credit card. We know God can. God can do it, and so we pray. We don't know if God will do it, but we know that he can. And so we always pray. One of my favorite stories, I may have told this story to you before, I'm sure I have, um, Pastor Don and his friend Glenn. These were two men that I, I loved dearly. Um, pastor Don was a longtime pastor in Louisiana, and he had a son that left home in his late teenage years, like 18 or 19 years old. He was gone for two years. Family had no idea where he was. Not a postcard, not a phone call, nothing. He and his wife were heartbroken. Well, Glenn was a buddy of Pastor Don's, and he drove a truck, and he, would, he drove all over the country. And one Sunday, uh, they were chatting, and Glenn said, well, I hit the road tomorrow heading across the country. And Pastor Don said, hey, Glenn, if you're ever out there and run into my boy Johnny, tell him to call his mama. Hadn't heard from him in two years. And Glenn said, I, I, you know where he is? And he said, we have no idea where he is. We haven't heard from him, but God knows where he is. The next day, Glenn got in his truck. He drove to San Antonio, Texas. They were loading his trailer, and he was just sitting over on the, on the loading dock on the side. He had a grapefruit. He cut it in half. He was going to eat the grapefruit. And he had half of a grapefruit, and he thought he would give it to somebody. And there's a guy standing over there. He said, uh, hey, you want the other half of this grapefruit? And the guy says, yeah, I think I will. And he walked over. He said, hey, my name's Glenn. He goes, my name's Johnny. And he says, uh, Johnny what? And he said, Johnny Johnson, not his real name. Uh, hey, where are you from? I'm from Louisiana. He says, is your dad Pastor Don? He says, he sure is. He goes, you need to call your mama. <laughs> Can you believe that story? The next day, God knows where he is. We pray big, bold prayers. Because God is sovereign and prayer is effective. Let's look at the next part of this story. I call it the rescue by God's power. It's in verses 6 through 17. So James has been killed. Peter has been arrested. They're going to put Peter to death. And then verse 6 we read, The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. As a person who struggles with sleep, I am shocked that he is sleeping the night before an execution. Last night, I slept from 2 to 3.30 because of this sermon right here. I'm not worried about any of y'all executing me. But what happens when, we're, when we worry? We toss and we turn. 
And yet, here is Peter sleeping on a prison floor. I can't sleep in cars. I can't sleep on planes or trains. I can't even sleep on a, a, a couch. When we flew back from Alaska. We flew overnight. Everyone in the plane was fast asleep. I stayed up the whole night just walking around cursing the people. Just like... <laughs> And Peter is in chains asleep. I had to do a sleep study one time. That's where they hook you up to all these wires. I made it two hours. And I was like, I got to get out of here. I, got, I, I didn't sleep a wink. So I went home at 2 a.m. that night. And uh, I can't imagine being chained to two men. You ever been to a men's retreat? It's like sleeping in a, in a den of bears. And here he is, just, you know why? Because Peter is the one who tells us, cast all your cares upon the Lord, for he cares for you. The Lord's peace is real. And Peter is a picture of it here. Yes, you are overworked and underpaid. You are overstressed and underappreciated. But let this story encourage you about the Prince of Peace, the one who slept in the middle of the storm. Verse 7, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the, in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. And the chains fell off Peter's wrist. And Peter is sleeping hard, isn't he? But I want you to notice throughout this whole story, Peter's totally passive. He's not MacGyver. No, this is all God. The chains fell off Peter's wrist. Not Peter had a paper clip. <laughs> Verse 8, the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did, which is always a good idea when you leave the house. Put on some clothes. And Peter did. Wrap the cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. So Peter followed him out of prison. But he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. And so in his stupor, Peter isn't sure what's happening. Is this a vision? Is this a dream? Have you ever had a dream that was so real you thought it was actually happening? Of course you have. We all have. Is, have any of you have a spouse that's ever gotten mad at you because of something they dreamed? <laughs> My wife has done that multiple times. <clears throat> you know what you did. I don't know what I did in your dream. Verse 10, they passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself. It says in the, in the original language, it opened for them automate. It opened for them automatically. And they went through it. And when they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. And then Peter came to himself and he said, now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. But that's all of our testimony, is it not? I, I know without a doubt that the Lord rescued me. That is our testimony. Verse 12, when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and we're praying. So we have a new character here, John Mark. Who, who is this John? We've got another John, John the Apostle. That's the brother of James. This is a different one. This is John Mark. You're going to see a lot of him through the, from the, here on out in the story. He's a companion of Paul. He's a companion of Barnabas. He's the author of the Gospel of Mark. They, Peter goes to his mama's house. And somehow Peter knows that's where everybody will be. Because that must have been the house. That must have been the place. And it's no small house. Luke tells us there's a large crowd there. And in a minute, we're going to learn there's, there's even a courtyard there. And so Mary is a woman of means. And she's a woman of resources. And she's using that to support the church. And if you've been paying attention, you'll notice, you know, we thank God for the women in the early church. Sociologist and historian Rodney Stark uh, estimates that in the first and second century, the church was about two-thirds female and about one-third male. 
We constantly see the women. Think about this, how we constantly see the women providing, housing, giving, supplying, and leading the early believers. Not unlike the Olympics. At one point yesterday, I looked up the medal count for the, for the U.S., and two-thirds of our medals have been won by the female athletes. Now, you take away all of theirs, and we would have been between the Netherlands and Canada. And so, um, that's just where we would have been. So, Peter arrives, and they're praying. And what are they praying about? They're praying for Peter's release. Now, try to catch the humor in this next scene. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was overwhelmed. She was so overwhelmed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. So you can imagine Peter. He's, he's been busted out of prison. He's sneaking through the streets. The church is tucked away praying for him. He's got soldiers, no doubt, searching for him. And so he knocks, and Rhoda is so excited, she forgets to let him in. Have you ever been so excited you forgot what you were doing? We had a lady in our church, uh, we'll call her Miss Carol. Uh, one day she was at her house, she was taking a bath, and her house caught on fire. And through all the commotion, uh, the alarm went off. She can't hear it because the water's running. The fire department responds there in her driveway. She turns off the water. She hears this. She gets up. She, you know, she's in her house alone, she thinks. And so she steps out. She sees smoke in the kitchen. Then she sees red lights in the driveway. She runs out stark naked to out in the driveway. And she's telling the fireman where the fire is. And one of the firemen goes, uh, Miss Carol, why don't we get you a towel? And all the excitement, she didn't even think. That's what Rhoda did. She was so excited. Peter's here. She doesn't even let him in the door. Verse 15. They told her, you're out of your mind. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. How condescending. How patronizing. Listen, they're praying for Peter's release. But he's probably already dead. That's what they're saying. You're probably seeing his ghost. You're seeing his angel. Uh, Peter's not there. This woman is insane in the membrane. Somebody get Rhoda some water. She's not doing good. Um, which tells me even the most faithful Christians can struggle to believe that God answers prayer. We can be great heroes and heroines of faith one moment, and we can be full of doubt the next. You ever been Rhoda? You ever had somebody tell you that you're crazy, that you're out of your mind because you are simply saying what you believe or trusting what God would do? Like God, God doesn't change people. Your marriage, will, your marriage is done. God can't save that. God doesn't change. You'll always suffer with this. Verse 16, but Peter kept on knocking. And when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Well, why were they astonished? They shouldn't have been astonished. That's what you were praying for. Write this down. God is in control even when my faith is weak. And that's good news. I'm so glad that God's working does not depend on my ability to trust him. Now, our faith is a factor in our lives. Absolutely, of course it is. But I can't tell you how many times in my life I have said to myself, my faith is small, but my God is big. I, I, the single truth that salvaged my life and salvaged my faith was that at my darkest, lowest point in my journey, when I couldn't trust God, I told myself, I told my wife, I don't know if I believe, I don't know if I can believe, but I do know that if God is real, He is good and He is greater than my weakness. And so Peter motioned with his hand... For, for them to be quiet. I'd really like to not go back to jail, y'all. So simmer down. And he described how the Lord brought him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said. And he left for another place. Now that's interesting. He's just been miraculously freed from prison by God. 
But he's like, guys, I can't stay here. I got to get somewhere safe. So he's just experienced this unmistakable miracle, but he says, I can't stay here. I've got to find somewhere because soldiers are looking for me. So Peter knows that God works miracles, but he doesn't expect God to work miracles every day. He doesn't exploit God's goodness, and he doesn't exploit God's power, and he doesn't put God to the test. He knows that miracles are the exception. Notice that Peter does not march into Jerusalem the next day singing MC Hammer. You got to be Gen X to get that one maybe. But he gives us a model to follow. Peter knows God does miracles. He knows God truly is involved in our lives. But he also knows that God has given us a brain. And he, and, and, he, and he gives us wisdom. And he wants us to live with ordinary wisdom. And so Peter gets out of there. So what does that mean for us? It means, yes, we pray. We trust. We pray big prayers. But we also lock our doors. And we wear our seatbelts and we study for our exams. One of my favorite authors and favorite humans on the planet is a guy named Bob Goff. His life is nothing short of remarkable. If you read one of his books, a little of his effervescence just falls off onto you. He's an attorney. And when he was trying to get into law school, he had a problem because his grades in college were not remarkable. And his LSAT scores were less than stellar. And so he applied to a bunch of law schools and was rejected by all of them, including the University of San Diego, where he really wanted to go. And so he went to the dean of the law school and asked the dean to admit him. He says, you can say the word, and they'll let me in. And so he presents his case. I'm going to study hard. I want to make a difference in the world. And the dean heard him out. And then he ushered him out the door and closed it and said, have a good life. And at that point is where most people would have walked away, right? Law school's not in it for me. But Bob says he kept thinking about all the times that Jesus changed a person's life with just a word. Just say it, Jesus, and it'll be done. Just say it, and they'll be healed. And so he found a bench outside of the dean's office. And this was five days before classes started. And he sat out there and he waited for the dean to come out into the hallway. And he said, Dean, he's like, you're back, Bob, because I'm back. He says, Dean, all you got to do is say the word and they'll let me in. All you got to do is say, buy, go buy your books and I'll be in. And the dean just smiled and laughed and kept going. Have a good day, Bob. He came back the next day. Same thing. All you got to do, Dean, is say, buy your books, and I'll get to go to school here. Have a good day, Bob. That went on for five days. Every day, the dean would just patronize him and keep going. First day of class comes, he's still not admitted. He sits out on the bench, and he waits for the dean. Same thing. Second day of class, same thing. Third day of class, he's out there on the bench. Dean, all you got to do is give the word. Fourth day, class has been going on for five days. The dean walks over to him and says, are you serious? Go buy your books. Go buy your books. See, God can do it, but he'll use us and he'll use our ordinary means and the ordinary means of life to bring rescue and to bring salvation to us. We got to close. Let's look at this last section. I call it the defeat of God's enemies. Now, the next episode tells us that Herod left town and he's given a speech to the people of Tyre and Sidon. And they've come to ask money and food from the king. And so, verse 21, on the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of a God, not of a man. Now, they don't believe that. They're just flattering him. The ancient historian Josephus tells us about this event. And Luke's story and Josephus' account align perfectly. 
Josephus tells us that Herod was wearing glistening silver robes that day. And the people are shouting. It's like a political rally. This man is a god. And they're appealing to his ego. They, they, don't, they don't believe he's a god. They just want food. And they know Herod wants glory. And so immediately, verse 23, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms. Josephus tells us a little more to the story. He says that the people are making these proclamations, and Josephus doesn't calm them down, or, or, or Herod doesn't calm them down. In fact, he says, it's something like out of Harry Potter. He says, Herod saw an owl perched on a rope above him, and he knew that was a harbinger of woe, that bad things were coming to him. And immediately, his whole body began to writhe in pain. And Josephus says that he died five days later, being eaten from the inside by stomach worms. So we have a man who wants to be God, but he's actually weaker than a worm. And Dr. Luke, the author of this story, he's a physician. He could tell us all about this illness, but he doesn't. He just tells us why he died. And he tells us it's because Herod did not give praise to God. He wanted to claim for himself which should only be given to God. Herod's problem is self-idolatry. Self-idolatry. Where we would rather be God than submit to God. Now... If you are a skeptic or maybe a non-Christian, you hear that and maybe you think, well, God sounds selfish. God demands the glory. Is God arrogant? Well, let me just pose it this way. What if your kids, what if your kids, uh, on graduation day, they get to high school graduation, they're 18 years old, and after everything you've done for them, all you've provided, all the sleepless nights, all the prayers, all the food, all the trips, you've kept them alive. And on their graduation, somebody says, wow, um, who do you have to thank for all this? And your kid says, well, really nobody. I pretty much did all this myself. <laughs> well, what about your parents? No, it was mostly me. Um, I pretty much did all this. What an insult, right? That doesn't make those parents arrogant. It's reality. What's selfishness? It's a sign of a heart polluted with pride. But, verse 24, and this is the conclusion, but the word of God continued to spread and flourish. We began this walk through the book of Acts, our series. First series was called Unhindered. You can't put the gospel in jail. Here we have the strongest man in the land trying to stop the gospel. We have the most powerful army on the planet trying to stomp out the church. And Luke says, but the word of God continued to spread and flourish. Here we are, 2,000 years later. All the times in history, people have tried to stomp out the gospel and destroy the church. It hasn't happened. It will not happen. Christianity has no threat of extinction. God is the king. So, let me close with two words. First one is a word of warning. Don't be a self-exalter. Don't be a self-idolater. Don't, don't be a Herod. Don't mock God. Every politician who thinks they can exploit the name of God for their own political expediency, I have a word of warning for them. God will bring you down one day. God will not let you take for yourself what actually and rightfully belongs to him. Now, God does not always put evil kings to death immediately. Not like this. But we know this, that unrighteousness will be dealt with. In God's world, no one gets away with anything. The wicked may put believers to death. And they have and they do and they will. But God will topple them eternally. Evil may triumph, but it will only triumph for an hour. And those who kill God's own will be judged. No one gets away with harming God's children. No one triumphs over the Lord. 
In Daniel 4, Nebuchadnezzar, the evil tyrant king, he has a vision. And it's the vision of this tree that stretches to the ends of the earth. And all the people and all the nations are under the branches of this tree. And the tree is himself. He's so self-exalted. And then God says to him, because you've exalted yourself, you will be humbled like an animal. And you'll eat grass like an ox. Set yourself up against the king of the world and you will regret it. Jesus says, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. So the first thing I think we have to hear in this passage is a word of warning. But the other thing is a word of hope. The king's mission is unstoppable. Opposition is inevitable, but the mission is unstoppable. The word of God continued to spread and flourish. No one triumphs over the Lord. No one stops the Lord's work. There's another way of saying that. Eventually, all our prayers are answered. Eventually, all our prayers are answered. Prayers of healing, prayers of hope, prayers of resurrection. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, or anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The king's mission is unstoppable. I wonder, as you read this story, you feel a lot like Herod? Think about your life. Have, have you been a self-exalter? Have you spent your life shaking your fist at God, denying his existence, ridiculing all these weak-minded believers, you know, these people that have faith as their crutch? Maybe God has spoke to your heart today. Maybe he's gotten through to you today. And you see something of Herod in yourself, and you say, I don't want to end up that way. I don't want to get eaten by worms. <laughs> I want to go home to glory. The gospel of grace is not that God despises you, but if you trust Jesus, then God will love you. The gospel is this. God has always loved you, and he most fully demonstrates that love through Christ dying and rising for you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would take your word today and plant it deep within, our, deep within us, deep within our souls that we might be transformed into the likeness of Christ, through whom we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.